Um, shall we start? Sure. Yes, sure. please. Uh, Ralph, yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, okay, right. So it's time. Uh, let's just do a quick roll call to see if everyone's here. OG, are you here? We're here. Okay, nice. Beautiful. Oh, oh. Oh, oh. We are both here. We're using the same device. Okay, nice. Uh, CG? Here. Nice. Uh, CEO? Here. Okay, right. So, welcome everyone to the Novice Grand Finals uh, of Japan PP 2020. I'll be your chair. My name is Ralph. I don't really have a gender pronoun. Just call me whatever you like. Uh, I'll let my panels introduce themselves. Let's start with Bloopy. Hello. Yeah, Bloopy here. No preferred pronouns. Just refer to us as panel. Good luck. All right, uh, Adel. Hi, I'm Adel. Uh, fine with you, Adel. Okay, uh, we have Amy. Um, hi, I'm Amy. I prefer to pronounce she, her. Thank you. Okay, and lastly, Aditya. Hi, everyone. I'm Aditya. No, I prefer gender pronouns, but I would strongly encourage teams to use gender neutral pronouns for the purpose of this debate. Thank you. All right, nice. So those are my panel. Uh, right, so I'll have OG introduce himself. Uh, from OG, we have Shibukoma. Um, hi, I'm Prime Minister. My name is Yuto Kira. I have no preferred gender pronouns. Okay. One second. Uh, DPM. Right, so I'm DPM, Kanukura, and no preference for the pronouns. Okay, all right. Beautiful. Uh, from LO, we have Capstone FG. Um, hi, I'm Guan Rong. Uh, no particular pref preferences. All right. Yellow. Hi, I'm C Kai. I'm him or his. All right. Okay. Thank you. Opening up. Uh, closing up, we have Kobe A. Hello, my name is Yoshiaki and I will be the member of government and I don't have any gender pronoun and also my partner doesn't have. Okay, cool. Uh, lastly, we have Capstone DJ, CEO. Uh, hi, I'm member, um, Janet. I don't have any gen sorry, my gender pronoun is she, her. And uh, hi, I'm Daniel, I'll be the opposition whip and I also have no particular preferences. Okay, nice. With the introduction done, uh, let's just do a few house cleaning. So since we have a lot of observers, I require all observers to meet themselves. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so without further ado, on the motion, uh, this house supports the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. I'd like to invite the Prime Minister to start with the debate. Here, here. So I'm just gonna bear my notes. Oh wait, real quick. Uh, can any one of the panelists time just in case? Because like I have my phone back up, so I can't really use the bit keeper. I will do it. All right. Thanks very much, Aditya. Okay. So yeah, start whenever. Okay, am I audible? Okay, thank you.
If you look at the world right now, international relationships around the world are not going great. The reason for this is because of stagnant trade and trade wars that are rampant in our society. We think that because of these regional ties and these partnerships, that this will be able to break this kind of stagnant trade and this kind of international tension between countries. And that's why we are proud to propose. So we have an argument to bring to you about how we are able to promote partnership and thus this leads to the stability of the world, right? So just before moving into our argument, I just want to contextualize this debate, right? In the current right world right now, there are two main actors that are involved in a large trade war, which is the United States and China, right? Because of the stagnant trade and because the United States, especially Trump, has had trade regulations on China, for example, involving problems about Huawei, that is not, that is why there's that if, if it affects businesses and it also is leading to tensions in international relationships, which I'm going to be addressing later on, right? We think this debate is about on our side of the house, the government side protects the world Point. where they do have these regional partnerships. No, thank you. And on their side of the house, they have to protect the status quo where there is these trade uh, these trade wars, right? Given this, I'm going to move into my first argument about how we promote partnership and this leads to the stability of the world, right? The thesis of this argument is that because of the existence of the regional com uh, comprehensive eco economic partnership, this will enhance the economy and this will better the ties between countries who are in this partnerships and this will actually increase the number of partnerships around the world, meaning this breaks the current status quo tension and the economic fluctuations and the stagnance that are currently happening right now, right? So to start off with, I want to address the problem that is rampant in the status quo, right? As I told you in the introduction, the context is that the United States and China are involved in a trade war, right? You can see this when Trump, for example, bans, um, bans Huawei and bans all multiple industries, the products of multiple industries to actually be imported and uh, imported into the country, right? And so there are two Two clear harms to this, right? First of all, this is ec this leads to economic fluctuation. There are three explicit uh, mechanisms to this, right? First of all, it stops the importing of products, right? What I mean by this is people are now unable to have access to, for example, uh, products that are from Ch China, right? This includes a lot of industries such as agriculture. It also includes uh, important uh, industries such as like technology and things like that in AI, right? But second of all, the process here is that industries are inter intermingled, right? I want to note that because industries are intermingled, if, for example, if I give you an example, Huawei is connected to a lot of companies in Japan and Korea, for example, right? Because it needs those kinds of small bits that are in, uh, in for example, the technological devices, right? So when... When Point. the United States holds this kind of importing from China, that also affects the companies that are in Japan and Korea and other nations that are connected to Huawei in that industry, right? So this means that it causes massive economic fluctuation, not limited to just China, right? But the third mechanism here is that the international reputation falls, right? Because note the fact that when there are trade regulations, when the United States does these kind of things, that like the global, uh, the global like market for goods they they have like dubious eyes towards the future of the Point. economy. That's why there's less funding. That is why there's less investment that goes into these companies such as Huawei, for example, right? And thus, these three mechanisms prove to you that there is economic fluctuation that happens, right? And there are two explicit harms to this, right? First of all, people lose access to goods, right? That you you saw this even in the agricultural industry, right? China has seventy percent of, for example, like large products of wheat uh, and uh, other items such as that, right? And people on the ground are unable to have access to that because now it is very high price, right? But the second harm is that workers lose their jobs, right? Because in, in large parts of the United States or in China, for example, companies were shut down because they weren't they weren't being able to import the goods or export the goods to the United States, for example, right? So we say that the conclusion Oi. is that there's a massive economical fluctuation that happens as a result of these trade wars. The second harm of the current status quo is that there's international tension, right? Because of economic sanctions and trade wars, this seeps into other problems, right? Because these countries, they try to influence each other also it also using diplomatic tactics, for example, right? Let me give you an example, right? Because recently the United States went to went into the Senkaku Islands and did a army train uh, did a army 
tactic with Japan, right? And the reason for that was that because they wanted to intimidate China because of exactly the trade regulations, and they wanted to kind of intimidate in order it, to intimidate to like back off in the economy, right? So you we would note here that because of these trade wars and these the tension that were created in economic stagnation that led to pol political disputes, which literally threatens our lives on Japan and even in China, right? And there are multiple other examples where trade regulations and these like disagreements in the economic field lead to political disputes, which importantly affect the people on the ground, right? So how does this change on our side of the house, right? Because there are two mechanisms to this. First of all, we are gonna make a partnership, right? And the important mechanism here is that when we create a partnership, this regional partnership, we think other countries are gonna come in too, right? Why is that the case? Because Point. if countries, no thank you, if countries join that partnership, they understand that it's lucrative, right? They understand that there's gonna be a more flow of goods. There's gonna be no more products, right? So European countries, Asian countries, which aren't in the regional connection right now are gonna want or have a motivation to go in, right? Given we have proven that there's going to be an increase of countries in this regional partnership, this leads to the second mechanism, right? We think that the US is gonna back off and weaken their tension or weaken their attacks on the economy, right? Two mechanisms under this. First of all, because of economic motivation, right? They realize that because the one third of the GDP is going to go in the regional partnership and they can't be involved in it, right? And that's why they're going to try to be friends with the region. They're gonna try, they're gonna drop guard on these uh, on these kind of things because they are gonna have significant economical damage, right? But secondly, just in terms of global standing, right? The United States wants to be in agreements, in, in agreements, right? Because they know because the people in their country are going to be mad that they are in their region region and they're shut out of trade right so there's two impacts right first of all the, the economic fluctuation is going to lessen right people are going to have jobs and there's going to be more access to goods because there's going to be a a, a further uh, increase in trade right uh, the second, the second is there's going to be international st stability, right? Because they're because these countries are going to deter each other from fighting each other because they're in a region. They're going to import and export, but also the industries are going to become intermingled, which means that they want to prevent conflict. We are proud to propose. All right, I thank you, Prime Minister. Like to invite the leader of opposition. If here. Am I visible and audible? <clears throat> okay. My time starts now. So before I move on to the counter stab and my uh, and my arguments, I'll move on. I'll go for the rebuttals first. Um, firstly, the prime minister told you that they they will solve trade wars and break economic fluctuation, right? But first of all, notice that the RCEP has no provision of dispute resolution. It is only a logistical agreement between these countries and ASEAN to promote free flow of goods and services that decrease the cost of importing, which we will tell you today that har it harms the economic independence, the growing economic independence we see in the developing world in ASEAN. Now, furthermore, they tell you that they tell you that there will be stability in the world and they bring on this huge burden for themselves and us to prove stability of the world. Now, judge, the world is important. The stability of the world economy is important. But notice today we do not have the burden to prove world stability, global stability in this debate because RCEP is strictly a regional economic deal. Therefore, the premise of this debate is strictly regional. But judge, even if you buy his three mechanisms of economic fluctuation, the RCEP does not solve this because like I said just now, the RCEP is simply a logistical agreement because uh, there is no substantial political allegiance signed off on it. On both sides of the house, economic disputes will still happen, but it is better on our side because at least when this happens on our side, poorer ASEAN countries compared to these European giants, these uh, uh, Pacific giants that they go up against, right? Our ASEAN countries will be more economically independent enough to stand up against these developed countries that try to take away their niche, try to take away their limited specialization that they have in their domestic economies that are smaller than the global giants. Furthermore, PM complains about high price of uh, imports that people in developing countries can't afford, but 
that's an absurd assumption that PM is making that people would want to buy imported goods, that people should buy imported goods. We tell you that they wouldn't necessarily do so because in these developing countries, we characterize them as more united people. They want to see their countries pro prospering. They want to see their local economies uh, developing, which is why when you implement something like the RCEP that boosts this kind of free trade agreement in um, these developing nations and the developed countries, this disrupts that dynamic between the consumer and also the producers, right? We tell you that they shouldn't also purchase uh, imported goods because that would reduce the kind of revenue that domestic producers get. And it is very crucial for domestic producers to get the revenue because that is how they innovate. That is how they fund the R&D needed to increase their international competitiveness. When you cut them off at their knees and start making imported goods cheaper, that is when people will start buying the imported, uh, imported goods and these, and, and these domestic economies, these domestic producers will lose out because their uh, sources of production will, cannot be so flexible and they won't enjoy the economies of scale like um, the developed nations would make. Furthermore, they talk about the US-China trade war, right? Judge, please make, I'll make it clear now that we do not have the burden of proving that this will resolve. We don't see why government thinks they have to prove it. In any case, they don't prove that it will resolve anyway because the RCEP is not a dispute resolution center. It is a logistical agreement for the de de developed countries and ASEAN countries. Moreover, on nations of RCEP, right, there's Australia, China, right. Japan, South Korea, New Zealand, and they're all very well-developed economic powers. They all specialize and dominate certain industries without the RCEP already. Now let's look at ASEAN. Compared to these superpowers who are relatively weaker, relatively lower production in economy, and very little developed industries, and they have limited range of specialization, like Vietnam is specialized in textiles, Malaysia in electronics, Indonesia in palm oil, Thailand in the automotive industry. We tell you that in, because of this characterization, because of this status quo that we are defending, we are so proud to propose this alternative that we would develop the local economy first, adopting more protectionist Point. policies to build more competitive local markets. I'll take you later, right? First of all, why, why print in the principal cause, why this better, right? Because our economy becomes independent of the developed nation. We become independent unities, uh, entities, right? Be the RCEP then erodes this economic sovereignty of developed nations, developing nations, triggering long-term failure to attain economic independence. Firstly, Economic sovereignty is the country's ability to make unchallenged decisions about its economy, as well as the domestic firm's ability to develop its own products. Secondly, RCEP threatens this for all ASEAN countries because of the low tariffs model of free trade that it adopts, because it makes log logistical flow and flow of goods and services between parties to RCEP much easier. As I've said earlier in my analysis, this makes local products less competitive compared to international products. For, thirdly, this makes imported goods and services cheaper, and ASEAN will not be able to stand up to China's manufacturing, Japan's electronics, and Korea's smartphone, etc. This triggers two things. Firstly, economic suffering and bottlenecks in smaller, less developed domestic economies in ASEAN, which we tell you comprises of less wealthy developed countries like Malaysia and growing developing countries like Thailand that focuses on automotive production. Two subpoints here. Firstly, excessive international interference in domestic economy right. siphons off revenue that could have gone completely back to the local economy. And like I said, triggers that cycle of revenue, triggers that cycle of R&D and improvement and gradually, gradually increasing competitiveness, right? Second subpoint, specializations within these countries risk getting taken away from uh, these developing developed countries when they go in and adopt their specializations and take it home and export this kind of specialization. This is very detrimental to ASEAN economies because their production market is already very small. And in order for them to grow into the international market, they need to maintain this niche. I'll take your point of information. You say our benefits don't occur because it's regional, but we already told you the mechanisms of how, how more countries are going to get into this partnership. And that means, and in, in it's virtually one third of the GDP. Why doesn't, why isn't there any motivation for the United States? Yeah, we tell you that firstly, the United States doesn't really like to go into, um, international relations, uh, international trade agreements with China specifically, because it just doesn't make sense for these big economies to to go to, to clash directly against each other in these. For Furthermore, the EU cannot join. They can only join democratic trade agreements. Um, moreover, 
uh, continuing on my point, right? We say that this also triggers cultural appropriation, which my partner will speak more about. But furthermore, if this niche and specialization that is already very limited, we see in developing uh, developing countries, economic rebuilding will cost much more. And lastly, the most important point: jobs will be taken away as there's a weak local economy and there are less jobs because when their economy doesn't develop and specialize and grow you won't be able to provide as many jobs together and we see this as a detriment to the quality of lives of these people in the developed world and because we form developing worlds that can that are able to stand up against the tyrannic developing developed world we are so proud to oppose thank you Right, uh, I thank the head of opposition. I can invite the deputy prime minister here. Yeah. Am I audible? Thanks. Um, for the opposition team to know, if you want to offer POI, please do. Please text in the chat or do it verbally or like in whatever method you want to do. So we think that the alternative approach that is proposed by the op opening opposition is extremely unlikely to happen. We're extremely dubious about that. We think that their plan as to being for those countries to be more protectionist and as a consequence being able to develop their own industry is extremely unlikely to happen. And we think on our side of the house, we're going to be able to bring about the benefit of international stability and also the benefit to individual consumers in both developing and developed nations for all degrees for all these reasons we're extremely proud to propose. So firstly, beginning with the rebuttals to what the previous speaker has said, right? They told us like, first of all, this RCEP has got no re dispute resolution mechanism, so there won't be any disputes resolved. Firstly, we do not think this is true, right? To begin with, right? Because we're not talking about the dispute resolution system that is going to promote more trade and to decrease the number of trade tensions. It is precisely the system of interdependency between those member countries, right? Because those countries export some goods and as a consequence, the other countries are going to export to you another type of goods, right? And as a consequence, these countries are going to be interdependent, which means that if you attack certain country economically, you're going to get a blow for this, right? Because you, because your own industry is going to get a blow on, from this, right? Because so certain industry within your country is getting, for example, like product supply from other countries, from the country that you want to sanction, right? Because of this interdependencies and this because of this complex system, it will be more difficult for politicians to just randomly impose trade sanctions just because there is something they didn't like happen to begin with. Secondly, they talked about domestic producers and like those domestic producers will be hit, right? First of all, we do not necessarily see the impact as to why this is absolutely the devil that we must avoid at all costs to begin with, right? We think that as other people who live in market economy, we have to see a certain amount of natural selection in the industries, right? Those small companies that fail to adapt to those international trade will have certain amount of them will have to disappear, right? Because that is for the benefit of the entire consumers who would like to purchase a cheaper good. And then they came up here and told us like, oh, this is going to lead to less jobs and unemployment. We do not think this is true to begin with, right? Because in the vast majority of those developing countries, as they have already told to us as well, like they do have like monocultural economy, for example, like, like Indonesia having, like those Southeast Asian countries having a palm oil industry as a at their dominant industry, right? We think that situation does not change much from the status quo like that. And furthermore, we tell you that it is not only developing countries dependent on developed countries, it is as well developed countries dependent on developing countries, precisely because they didn't do any things like what's in being imported from Malaysia or like palm oils in the, exported from those countries. And we, 
And this also a prerequisite for people to live, right? And therefore, because developed nation as well is going to be dependent on developing countries, there's no such thing as exploitation as the op opening opposition character is, is going to happen to begin with. Moving on to constructed materials, why on our side of the house, we're, with RCEP, we're gonna have a more interrelations and why that is going to lead to less trade war and why that is going to lead to less war and tension. And finally, the comparisons as to why on our side of the house, we'll be able to have better utility. So first point, I think that as I have already, as we have already continuously explained to you, there will be a interrelationship, right? So for example, like when you look at the status quo, for example, like Japan and countries like Japan and South Korea export things like silicon to China for them to produce things like CPU, right? And in that instances, China is dependent on us, on countries like Japan and Korea for the export. Point. We are also dependent on those countries as well. Well, I'll take you in a minute. And in the other industries, the other parties might be dependent on other countries and the vice versa is going to stand, right? Which means that one country attacking the other country comes at the expense of their own certain industry. I'll take your POI. Inside your speech, you said there'll be high levels of interdependency within the developed and developing world. But doesn't that mean if a single market collapses and all of the market will collapse, furthering our point about weaker economic sovereignty? Well, first of all, although these countries are going to be interdependent, RCEP is not the only economy, economical cycle that exists in the world to begin with, right? And secondly, we think that it is extremely unlikely that an entire industry within a certain country is going to suddenly collapse all of a sudden. We think that it's extremely unlikely scenario to begin with. Moving on, right? So we think that because these industries become way too interrelated and form a way too complex system, it will be almost impossible for nobody to understand this system, which means that politicians will be less inclined to take some measures such as trade war because they do not know what, a, what kind of consequence is going to follow. We think that is going to be a huge deterrence. And secondly, talking about why there will be less war intention. Firstly, talking about within those countries, right? we think the mechanism for the less trade war is also going to apply here to begin with. And secondly, what for countries outside this RCEP, the motivation for them not to cause war is that because when they start those wars, they are going to suffer for the lack of import and export. But these countries in RCEP, they have alternative within that trade group, right? We think that this means that those countries within the RCEP are going to have advantage over countries who are not in, which means that those countries outside the RCEP will be will have very less incentives to attack those countries within this cycle. And for this, and for exactly for this same mechanism, more countries would like to join the RCEP, right? Because if they do so, they will be able to have more countries that are going to support them economically. And finally, about the comparisons, right? So basically, the only, only disadvantages of taking this motion coming from the op entire opposition bench is that certain domestic producers are going to fail and protectionism is better on that scenario. Well, first of all, we have already told you that this is extremely unlikely, but let's take the best case scenario coming from the opposition side and say that these kinds of markets are gonna collapse, right? We think that the kind of problem that we can prevent on our side of the house is much bigger, right? Because we're talking about the Sino-US trade war, and we have already explained to you the mechanism as to why those kinds of things are unlikely to happen. And these kind of things lead to unemployment, not only in China, but also in countries like Japan, because we supply goods to Chinese companies, right? We think that this entire mechanism shows that the amount of like the damage that is caused by these kinds of protectionism and trade war is way bigger than those domestic certain domestic producers failing. For all these reasons, we extremely proud to propose. All right, I thank the DPM. I'd like to invite the DLO. Yeah. Hi, is everyone ready? Okay, uh, my time starts 
Now, Mr. Speaker, if there's one reason why opening government has lost today's debate, it is because they're debating under the wrong premise. Two things when I say this, right? First, I'd like to point out that there's basically been no engagement by partners analysis that today's debate is about a regional debate, how this is a regional agreement, so it cannot extend to the world, and how we should debate under the region and not evade world stability. That is simply too big of a burden to push on us. Today's debate is about the RCEP and this regional area, not about the war, world, right? But secondly, we see that even if we bind to the premise about the entire world, we still say that it's very Fought because they're simply debating in many years ago, right? Throughout their speech, they cite the trade war, they cite very like isolationist and protectionist policies of America, and they talk about the Trump administration. However, the Trump administration has already lost today's has already lost the election, and it is now the Biden administration in charge of America. Right? Biden is not isolationist. He himself has already said that he wants to develop key economic allies with South Korea, with Japan, and with these nations. Um, he says he wants to open America back up to the world and reinstate all of those free global trade. Right? He says himself specifically said he does not want trade war and he does not want any tariffs. Because of this, we don't really see how the whole premise about like trade wars will occur if we don't do this really stands anymore because we're debating under a new world with a different American government. Anyhow, with this premise taken down, we can already disregard most of the government's case, but I will still give some quick responses anyways before moving on to my sole argument about cultural appropriation and why we need to have um why we need to have diverse cultures and in return why we cannot have our the RCEP. To begin with, let's look at what side um gov, uh, deputy Prime Minister really gives you, right? They give you a main argument about interdependency. And we say that to a certain extent, this interdependency does exist. However, we believe that this goes both ways, right? We've explained to you many times about how because of this interdependency, there will be no economic sovereignty. My partner has explained that when there is interdependency, economic sovereignty really weakens, firstly, because of two reasons, right? First, we have to just say that in general, economic interdependency is very dangerous for economies. We saw this multiple times in history because America's economy was so interconnected with the rest of the world. When the American economy collapsed in 2008, we saw a worldwide ripple effect with multiple economies all across the world collapsing. With the Greece economy collapsing, we saw a euro crisis that also swept through Europe. When Hong Kong collapsed, we saw an Asian financial crisis. The fact of the matter is when we have interdependency, it only takes a single nation or even just a single powerful city to have their economy collapse for the entire region to be thrown into chaos. We say that in such a volatile region, we, we cannot have a RCEP because that makes the chances of falling into recession and chances of economic um, hardship increase substantially because of this interdependency, right? But furthermore, more, even though it is interdependency, does not mean it is a complete interdependency. We say that this interdependency will still won't be fair because developing nations will still be more dependent on developed countries than developed countries are on developing. This logic is very simple, right? China is able to afford to, loo to lose an Asian country. After all, China exports all over the world and China exports to all 10 Asian nations. If Indonesia um, has imports from China, electric cars, and almost all of the manufactured goods, they're going to be much more dependent on China than the other way around. Because certain economies are simply bigger and are able to take the hits than other economies, we will never see true interdependency. And this means that many of the arguments which arise from true dependency is already weakened. But furthermore, this once again proves my partner's argument about economic sovereignty and about how countries will be able to export political and economic control. Furthermore, right, we also say that the argument, the further argument brought upon by um, closing government is by uh, deputy prime minister is really just a derivative of prime minister's speech. But lastly, uh, I like to point out that um, their argument about how independence is able to stop wars does not really stand in today's debate because on both sides, war will never occur. ASEAN, China, Japan, this region is very wealthy and very stable. We will, we will not have seen a war to begin with anyways, right? Why would China suddenly declare a war on Japan? That makes absolutely no sense. The fact of the matter is, War was never a voting issue to begin with, and stopping wars does not change anything because on both sides, even without the RCEP, war would have not have arisen. Anyhow, moving on to my case about cultural appropriation, right? Quickly, I should point out that this policy is essentially a form of economic globalization and economies will start to mingle together, right? But we, we have to realize that globalization comes hand in hand. With economic globalization, there will be cultural globalization. And we have to say that China holds a relatively, China and Japan hold a relatively cultural hegemony within this region, right? And with cultural globalization, that means many weaker nations' culture will slowly disappear and erode through time. The logic is very simple. The economic globalization causes a spread of imports because um, countries will not be able to earn more money from this free trade. And import contains culture, right? Like Japan's anime is very culturally uh, powerful. And when it's important, China, lots of Chinese citizens are now watching it. Korea's K-pop is also a very Wait. powerful form of cultural imports that is given all over China and Thailand and all these nations, right? Before I move on, I'll take your point. You attacked our interdependency by saying this is only a regional subject, right? Then how does your logic on cultural appropriation, like sp spreading and globalizing work? 
Oh, because when I say globalization, I don't mean the global world. I just mean within this region, right? That's why I did not say, oh, America's the cultural hegemony. I said, within these 10 countries, China and Japan are cultural hegemonies because China has 5,000 years of history and a very deeply rooted culture. And Japan is just really good at making culture. They were really good at making anime, right? Because of these two reasons, we can see that these relatively more developed nations like China, South Korea, and Japan have a much more powerful cultural hegemony than these relatively less developed countries like Thailand, like um, Australia or New Zealand, right? We say that because of this, the spread of imports through economic globalization will also cause a spread of culture and a spread of idea, which further spreads culture, right? And this means that the spread of culture will cause cultural appropriation because with no ability to essentially put up tariffs against these imports, these cultures will die. We can we see this multiple times, right? And we can give an example of South Korea. South Korea's K-pop and uh, like TV drama culture was not as powerful as it used to be before. It was, they were dominated by America's cultural hegemony. However, it was only after South Korea put up very powerful tariffs and essentially just told America, you're only allowed to put certain movies every year in our in like our films and gave heavy subsidies to the K-pop industry where the culture able to develop. The fact of the matter is because um, AC nations have very weak culture relative to um, China or Japan, or at least relatively less developed culture, when we take down these tariffs and we take down the ability for them to protect their own culture, it will cause um, cultural appropriation as people tend towards Japan or people tend towards China, right? We already saw this happen in the 1950s of the American cultural hegemony spreading over the world. In, a f in just a few decades, the world went from traditional weddings to buying diamond rings. In just a few decades, the world went from singing their own local songs to singing American songs. The fact of the matter is we've seen cultural appropriation happen before through economic globalization and the factors are exactly the same in today's world. With this um, uh, RCEP, we will see cultural appropriation and we will see the downfall of multiple cultures throughout ASEAN and through Australia and New Zealand. Because we stand for cultural diversity and because we stand for the people's right to have their own culture and cultural independence, we do not support cultural appropriation, we do not support the RCEP. All right, uh, I thank the DLO. I'd like to invite the member of Gross to start off the closing health exchanges. Here, here. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, before with my speech, uh, I would like, if you have any point of information, please put it on the chat and I will be watching it. And if I have time, I will take it. Thank you, judges. When you look at the status quo, there is America has a big power. And for example, other countries like European nation have like the EU, which has a regional connection and they support with each other. But when you look at Japan or other kind of Asian country, even if there are some regional support, you think that is not strong enough, thinking about the each individual power and those kinds. We think the regional comprehensive economic partnership in these circumstances is very important for those uh, region. That's why we're very happy to propose this motion. So basically, I'm going to talk about two things in my speech. Firstly, how historically free trade has been made, and let's look at the you know, status quo and why it is necessary for those um, regional comprehensive uh, economic partnership in those areas. And secondly, um, um, practically, how regional comprehensive economic partnership will um, enforce the economic growth of each individual land, and it will not only you know profit the um, you know developing country, but also the you know uh, developed country that actually exists in that area. So. What we're going to talk about from the closing government is we're going to talk about how the our world looks like in more uh, concrete level. So like how the economic growth will be made and will be happier for the citizen of each individual. That will be the things I'm going to provide from the closing government. So well, moving into the first point, how history of free trade has been made and how it is this quote look like and why it is necessary. Well, we think the uh, start from the free trade was like, you know, 
the forming, form, forming of the WTO uh, World Trade Organization. And the reason why this kind of you know, formation uh, organ, organization was formed is because those people, uh, the you know, government or many countries think that World War II or those kind of fight was formed by the, uh, the reason of the protection, idea of protecting, uh, protectionism. And we think, uh, in order to uh, eradicate or try to mitigate those harm from happening, re uh, happening again, they actually moving on to the free trade. So let's look at the status quo. What was formed is like you know EU was formed in order uh, uh, from you know in order to mitigate that harm, or like you know America has a, um, a big harm uh, market in order to you know form uh, the re peace relationship with those. In that circumstances, what is the problem with status quo? It's like, if you look at the Japan or New Zealand, or Australia or other kind of thing, like I told you in the introduction, they may have like some kind of regional uh, uh, regional partnership, but that is not strong enough to, in order for them to actually fight back, uh, uh, like, you know, counter to the EU or, you know, America as, you know, big market or those kind of thing. So we think it is necessary for those, you know, regional uh, area to actually form those regional comprehensions. So moving on second, more importantly, how this will be better for those people which actually live and how our world looks like. Well, like it is ideal, like, you know, opening opposition or other opposition might say, like maybe even like, if like individual has a, a own power to, you know, be independent and form their uh, technology or those kind of things, it's much better. But the reality is like, you know, when you look at the United States, they have a oil, they have a lo uh, labor force, they have a coal, they have a lot of resources compared to if you look at Japan or if you look at the only China or if you look at other kind of Asian countries, they don't have as individually they don't have a power to do that right that is the reason why you know um eu actually formed in order to you know counter those uh, uh, places so how will be uh, efficiently Oi. or change in our side of the house uh, later and we think the what is available in our side of the house is like right man in the right place that means like they each in individual brand has the right, uh, uh, right, uh, the better thing they are compared to other land. And we think this kind of uh, relation is used. The reason why Airbus was available to counter the Boeing, even though each of the individual country in the in, uh, European country is not strong enough, is they are actually to use that right man in the right place mechanism. That means like, you know, they can get the wing from the Germany or nose from the Finland or those kind of uh, uh, things that are good at on the individual country. We think same is available in these Asian country. When you look at the status quo, Fabulous company actually exists in Japan on those kind of things. So how this kind of populist company actually exists? How they is what is the mechanism? So we think the you know the populist company actually exists. There is a uh, so in Japan or other kind of developed country uh, in that Asian country, they don't have a factory in that thing. So in that country, so what they do is actually think about the design or those kind of thing and. So what? Uh, so how are those design are being made? Is uh, are in developing country, which is have comparatively labor uh, cheaper labor force or other places. Do you think that this kind of fabulous company actually exists, exists and it will be better? Yes. How do you mitigate the harms of the power imbalance within this regional comprehensive uh, economic? Okay. Corporate? Okay. We think maybe it is. Uh, we do concede to there are certain you know power imbalance, but if we don't have those kind of you know uh, regional comprehensive economic partnership comparatively, we cannot see how in their side of the house these kind of country, which is developing country, can uh, be better or can develop by themselves, right? We think that is the uh, comparative debate we are talking about. So how it will be look like is like these kind of public company or things kind of company were actually a uh, Good for the environment, a uh, developed country in that you know Asian country or developing country because you know from the developed country they can produce cheaper and you know developing country they can get the labor for, uh, labor for, and you know uh, yeah it's possible. So what will be consequence of this is like more of the multinational company will enter this Asian country or ASEAN country uh, like uh, poor country in those area in those circumstances. 
we think it is able to actually get this uh, citizens in that area can get more you know labor force and if you look at the long term this will actually uh, grow the economic of each individual Asian country. And we think that is why it is important to be not to do protectionism in their, uh, in, like they said, in their side of the house, but for those individuals in the Asian country, it's much better. That's why we're very happy to propose. Right, I thank you, Member Kaplan, for inviting me. Uh, am I audible? Okay, okay. Set my timer. Okay. Starting in three, two, one. Okay. So we see that on closing opposition, we got the metric a yardstick everyone can agree on is that you know we get good trade. We want to we both want to get good trade relationships between different countries, especially in the Asian region. We want to fair run to achieve fair trade and a trade equilibrium on our side. And so today on closing opposition, I will explain to you why this is better achieved on our side, right? So first, uh, two main arguments brought to you by close closing opposition. Uh, Firstly, how principally the RCEP enables economic power outfits um, like China to further extend its grasp on weaker domestic economies and why this is principally unjust. Secondly, a comparative on free trade and why on our side we can better achieve free trade and while on, on their side this, this is a uh, damage, right? So, okay, starting on my first point, right? We see that, okay, so, uh, a, so a, uh, we see that uh, we see that on Asian, on Asian, right? They have uh, what's unique about them is that they have a specialization of different countries, which means that they are essentially in interdependent on each other because each of just each country there, they only make one, only a, one or maybe a few types of um, of of products. They only export one type of product, which means that these countries are dependent are interdependent on each other. However, on prop side, once we add economic powerhouses like China, most importantly China into the mix, this automatically enables China to spread their invisible hand in weaker economies. We see this is principally unjust for them to for China to meddle with these domestic economies. And because we see that you no know, once China comes into the mix, um we see that uh now this kind of uh this kind of balanced interdependence Inter interdependency in the a in Asian is now is now destroyed. You see that now China will will control all of the exports of the imports. We see this especially, for example, in Indonesia, where we see that because of China's meddling in their domestic economy, we see that now um, a large percent of both their exports and imports are now controlled by China, and so we see this really large disparity between um, China and the other countries there, right? So that's why we don't see why when um, o OG says that um, no developed and developing countries are independent, we don't see why this happens. Right? And I will also stand on this later by telling you why, you know, on their side, especially China will now have even more influence over these countries, right? So now CG talked about this by saying that, okay, by giving your good example of the EU, right? They talked about, oh, the EU helps countries be dependent on each other. No, this enables developing countries to improve their economy. However, let's look at what the EU is, right? In fact, the EU gate keeps itself to richer countries. They have strict economic standards, which only enables richer countries to enter their trade circle. And even so, if, and even so right, we see that uh, countries that only reach the bare minimum of these standards, like Greece, right? Like Greece, it's like Greece is heavily affected by the EU's uh, large economic disparity. Why? We see that, uh, we see that, we see that in the example of, you know, the, the European Central Bank is controlling all the money. We see that, we see that now uh, most of their exports and imports are controlled by the richer countries. So we don't see why, you know, such 
the RCEP would be better in this regard, especially when we see an even larger economic disparity between countries in this in this circle. There is no uh, economic standard, so we see that there are going to be really really poor countries and really rich countries, and that, so we so we so we see that this is inherently very very harmful. So now on to my second point, which is a comparative on free trade and why on uh, and why on our side we can bring a better free we can bring better free trade right. So on government side, we see that uh, this we said they inherently harm free trade. Why is that so? We see that okay in the status quo we have two economic powerhouses in this debate, which are U.S. and China. So let's talk about my first point. China is now enabled to stretch its economic its invisible economic graphs on Asian economic economy. So we see that so that they will control all their imports and exports, right? So while China now on government side reaps all the results from this, right? We see that uh, effectively they're just taking the U.S.'s share. So now U.S. is no shun from trading within uh, Asian economies. So we so as a result we see a disparity of. A, re a really large disparity of power between US and China in the Asian regions. So why is this harmful, right? So first let's talk about the US. So, you know, uh, so the opening half already talked about, you know, Joe Biden's economic policy and how they want to extend uh, their trading to more uh, um, internationally, right? So as we see that under this economic policy, once we shun the US from, once we shun the US, from uh, from trading with from trading with Asian economies, then we see that the U.S. is going to get very aggressive because now they do not have anywhere to send their exports, and they do not now they do not have imports. So, and so effectively, the U.S. is going to be very uh, aggressive. What would they do, right? They will just they will continue to. Um, they will continue to have aggressive economic policies like you no know, sanctions on these. On these weaker Asian economies, which then, which then harms both the U.S. and these Asian economies, right? And so we see that also, you know, on China, right? We talked, I talked already talked about how you know China is going to even more so um, extend its um, economic power onto these countries, right? And so we see this also harms these um, poorer Asian economies because now all their economic power. Are in the grabs of China, and so we see that now basically they do not have any economic power, and so because China controls all of their economies, um, in the future and in, in the long run, right, these uh, Asian economies will now not be able to continue to develop to to develop their economies further and to start to become more inde independent on themselves. So, however, why why can we get free trade easier on our side, right? Firstly, we keep the interdependency between poor Asian countries. You know, we, we I just talked about how you know this, the thing that's unique with Asian countries is that they have specialization, right? And so, as a result, and so as a result, we see that we keep the specialization, and also we don't get a large power disparity between China and the U.S. on our side. Very proud to oppose. Thank you. Right, I thank the opposition. Let's invite the government worker here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, am I audible? Invisible. Three, two, one. Panel, I think it's quite relieving the government bench, the entirety of the government bench, which is to contextualize their entire case on the issue of like China versus US relations. And I think what is fundamentally dissonant in that characterization is the complete absence of like, any reference to that very notion that they so that they find so important after around like one minute of each of their speeches, right? They're, they give they have like lackluster explanation as to why this um actually happens. Before I continue my speech, a few clarifications, right? First of all, we, we think that, you know, regional trade partner, partnerships, uh, such as like the PACs that in, uh, have exacerbated the very issue that, like between the U.S. and China that, you know, the entire the entirety of the government that squishes you is to be so important, right? Things like the NAFTA and the USMCA and things like agreements that China are in, um, 
I end up focusing all the attention of these countries towards the regional, uh, towards these regional partnerships rather than engaging with real trade, uh, with international trade, which is something that they have un been unable to solve. Right? They end up, you know, rambling a bunch of baseless information, and we think that this is not the main crux of the debate. Uh, right? Uh, we think that, like our uh, second ball, we think that, like our, uh, like how our opening option characterized, we tell you that the entirety of the props framework is incorrect. In right? Rather, rather than focusing on like relations between China and the rest of the world or China and like other countries that are like countries in Europe or Africa. Again, yeah, this is about the region. This is about the countries within the um within the RCEF, right? Finally, we think that whilst the open whilst our opening opposition talked about things like protectionism and you know talked about things like how these hegemonic countries like China and Japan can spread their culture through these to these weaker countries. Uh, we talked about you know my, my partner Jatin gave you uh, two unique extensions. Firstly, how this how principally why these large hegemonic countries should not stick their hands in the, of the in the domestic economies of these other countries. And she gave you second of all a comparison as to counterfactuals. So three things I'll be doing. Right? First of all, I'll be rebutting the opening government. Second of all, I'll be doing the same thing to the closing government. And finally, I'll be proving why ultimately closing opposition takes this debate. Right. So first of all. To, to engage with our opening government, right? So they give us like three or so main arguments, right? First of all, how like the exploitation of these, you know, smaller countries or this exploitation of countries with weaker economies than China is just simply not real, right? First of all, we say that, okay, maybe this is not the case in the most extreme sense, but we think that they all, in all the other senses, this is, you know, very real to a very large extent, right? My, my partner talked about, you know, how China deeply influences the economies of countries like, you know, Malaysia and Indonesia. And I also like to bring up, you know, the fact that, you know, countries like Australia, Australia and New Zealand are, have economies that are directly tied to the Chinese economy. This very fact is a breach of the sovereignty of these nations. We don't think that the RCEF does any good to that, right? Saying, well, they said, that, okay, they're going to reduce trade wars and discriminates, right? Uh, not only has our opening opposition very clearly proved that, you know, there is no war to be uh, argued about, but second of all, we think that not, this will not, you know, this, this will not reduce the likelihood of trade war. You know, we think that this, this mere construct of a, you know, uh, social part uh, of an economic partnership does not do anything. That we think that our op opening opposition has already addressed that. Finally, they said, okay, they're going to create this utopic trade pact where everybody is welcome. But first of all, you know, they also, they've conceded like the USA really, ha they've conceded that the USA generally just not, does not like to engage themselves with, you know, within trade packs, such as like the trans pacific partnership. But then finally, right, we think it's very bizarre, but this is such a crucial moment in this debate, right? We think that it's more important to address why the, why the RCEF is so impactful and so detrimental to, to these regional countries, right? So as a whole, right, we think that like either uh, as the uh, as the closing opposition, we can either engage with their burden, right, and we don't. And we think that on either why on either um on either uh, explanation where you win, right? First of all, if we engage with their burden, we say that we tell you that okay, uh, these countries will be more hurt. We have the regional economic regional economy economies focus uh, focus on these regions only, and does not allow you know China to somehow interact with the USA. And if we don't engage with them, we uh, I think that our opening option has already sufficiently mitigated them. We say that like a better route has not given by the opening government at all, or either or the closing government. So either way, we can have the uh, the option wins, right? So now to engage with the closing government, right? Even though. And I can give them sort of like one main extension they give. And they say that, okay, you know, organizations are good and we generally want people to work together. They give you examples of like the United Nations and things like NAFTA and like the USMCA. We think, okay, all of these organizations have generally have negative aspects. My partner talking about how like Greece is a overwhelming example of why the, why, why hegemonic countries in the EU causes detriment to other smaller countries, right? The fact that the US had, the, the, that Greece had to fake, it's like a, a two year long, uh, Debt crisis when the country that completely collapses economy just goes to show you you know the harms of um the harms of trade unions right but yeah this is exacerbated with the RCEP because there is a larger um, disparity between China versus smaller countries like Laos or Myanmar right I think that um even this, even if uh, unions are good we think that the opening uh, option ultimately also proves that culturally uh, it marginalizes these less powerful countries for the very fact that like. Uh, the uh, large countries like China and Japan and Korea have cultural hegemonies, right? We think other than this, they don't really differ from the opening. Uh, we think that the closing government really doesn't differ from the opening government. Uh, and we think that because that we've already, because of the fact that we've already mitigated the opening government, we think that this equally applies to the uh, closing government, right? If they really want to ensure free trade amongst these countries, we think that a multinational partnership is really not the solution that they need to aim for. We think that on our side, when we guarantee that these countries can, you know, still work together without having our side, we think this is so much more better. We think that as a, as a whole, we think that uh, it's really cont it's contextually questionable why they follow along with the burden that they that their opening side, you know, frames. And we think that although, and, and yet they still do it, right? We think that as a whole, we've proven to you that, first of all, their burden really doesn't make sense in the next day. And saying, well, even if you take the burden away, even if we do take that, we say that, okay, we mitigated our argument. Our argument. So, as a whole, right, why does closing opposition win this debate? So, uh, to, you know, tackle our entire government, right? first of all, we think that it would be preposterous to give either 
either dumb team to win, right? So we've told you they've argued for the wrong spirit and intent of the motion, right? The motion clearly reads this house supports the regional, uh, the RCF, the, the RCEF, which focuses on the region within, you know, East Asia, not any other country, not Europe, not U the United States. We said, well, we've mitigated uh, fully, uh, we engaged and mitigated with, you know, with the arguments, even if we buy the burden, right? We tell you that, okay, even if even if these unions are good, even if you assume that like the RCEF will bring more goods to the country, we tell you that this is not the case. And panel, even if you don't believe them, or even if you say, okay, no, their, their arguments are great. We say that we give you a better comparative on our side. We do that on a, in a world we, where we don't have the RCEF, in a world where we where, where uh, the, this union amongst these East Asian countries don't exist. We, we tell you that smaller countries will benefit. Smaller countries no longer have a um, no, no longer be uh, hurt by the large hegemonic countries. They will, they will be able to develop their domestic economies. And they will not have the hand, the you know, the invisible hand of these large hegemonic countries like China within their domestic economies. So, Pam, right? What have I told you in my speech? Right. First of all, I told you I've clarified the actual you know focus of the day. I, I have and I've clarified that only opposition can win this day because we focus on the correct aspect of this debate. Right. We tell you that none of the uh, opening, uh, none of the government teams are able to do that, and it's too late for them to frankly do anything. Right. First of all, uh, I've you know mitigated the opening government. And saying, well, I've, you know, I've, I pointed out the closing government really doesn't bring anything new. And finally, I've given, a, I've given, a, I've given a comparison to why closing option really should bring this debate. For all of these reasons, I'm very proud to us. All right. Uh, thank you, opposition whip. All right. So that concludes the debate. I'd like to invite everyone to virtually cross floor, shake hands, and the judges will move to the duration room.